Ako vous amenez, vous amenez quoi de bon? All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let us continue where we left off. Um, back to testate law. Now, as mentioned, you know, previously we've been discussing different aspects of common law. And what happens if this happens, or what happens if that happens? And I've mentioned to you that the whole point of you understanding the common law is that you are 
able to change it for your client should your client deem it necessary. If we remain in certain aspects in the will, then the common law will take over. And by looking at 2A, 2B, C, the rules of disqualification, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and all those different aspects of common law, it's important we are in a position to speak to our clients about this because certainly some aspects of that common law your client will not be favorable with. Keeping in mind that we want to draft this law in such a manner that, um, um, that there can be no disputes at the end of the day. So when we speak of freedom of testation and we said your client can do what he or she wants with their will, it basically means that you can't be taught how to draft a will because anything goes, as long as you comply with the formalities and it's not illegal or immoral conditions is not put forward. However, what is important is that we understand the common law and we understand some basic various subheadings that we would put in a will. Because if we understand the different concepts or clauses we put in a will, then we are able to draft towards those clauses whatever it is that our client wants. So what I want to discuss with you now is different subheadings or different clauses we typically find in a will. Keeping in mind your client came there because he or she wanted to give his estate to certain people, his or her estate to certain people. But before we even get to that clause of where we nominate beneficiaries for the will, there's certain other clauses we have to consider. Okay. So first of all, the first clause we would need to consider, and it's something we've spoken about already, is the revocation clause. Now, we said that's where you revoke all previous wills. So personally, when I draft a will, I started off with a heading that says revocation clause, and underneath it, I just say I revoke all previous wills. Now, ladies and gentlemen, no one wants to come and draft multiple wills to be read together. Everyone wants one will to take a seat. So whenever you get a client, no matter if it is their first will that they claim to be making, put a revocation clause just for in case there's nothing else that pops forward. Obviously, if there's a revocation clause and it's the last dated will that's been brought forward, it means all previous wills will be invalid, which is ultimately what your client wants. We don't want any issues regarding multiple wills at the end of the day. Another sub clause that you would need to consider, and this is, uh, this is again common law. So the term collation, collation, C O double L A T I O N. Collation is another aspect of common law we need to understand. So let's talk about that for a second. Collation is an assumption that it is assumed that during the course of your children's lifetime, you would have wanted to benefit your children equally. Now, the key word I'm using is children. So this only applies to your direct descendants, to your kids, in other words. So let us say I have a million rand in my deceased estate, and my will says my kids are my heirs, and I have two kids. It means my children should get 500,000 rand each. But collation says, hold on, let's first go to when they were alive. When you were alive, you said to your kids, when they turn 18, they're going to each get a car. Your one kid's 18, your other kid's 16 when you die. The kid that's 18, you bought a 100,000 rand car for. The kid that's 16, you haven't bought a 100,000 rand car for because they're not of age yet. So, collation then says, we first need to go and give that 16 year old 100,000 rand, the value of that car that you bought for the 18 year old. Then what's left? will be divided between the two kids equally. Now that sounds like a plausible clause and it sounds quite thin. However, I've come across in practice that that clause creates a number of disputes. Sorry, and Kyle. Sorry, um, can, can you please check your, your mic? Your sound is very bad. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, perfect now. Tell me, Nana, were you struggling to hear me, all of you? Yeah, now it's clear. All right. So, so let's start over with collation then for those who were struggling to hear me. All right. So we said that the first clause we would consider in a will was revocation. 
to revoke all previous rules. That one we discussed already. The second clause I said we'll consider is collation. Collation applies or implies that you would have wanted to benefit your children equally during their lifetime. So, uh, key word being children. So, this applies to your direct descendants. So, let us say you have a will and you nominate your two children as your heirs and you have a million rand in your deceased estate. It means your children will each get 500,000 rand each. But before we give your children off, we first go look at what happened during their lifetime. So for argument's sake, I gave the example now and I said, let's say you told your children when they are 18, you will buy them a car. So you die and your one kid's 18, your other kid's 16. The 18 year old, you purchased a car worth 100,000 rand for. The 16 year old, you have not purchased a vehicle for because they haven't turned 18, but now you die. So collation says we must first go to that 16 year old and give that 16 year old the value of the vehicle that you gave to the 18 year old. In other words, give them 100,000 Rand. Take that from the estate. And then what's left, we divide equally. So that sounds like a plausible clause as such. It sounds fair. However, in my practical experience, what I've picked up is then you start having bickering in the sense of, but you received that. No, but you received that. And it becomes a very difficult sort of scenario to understand who was benefited more than the other. Um, and you often have disputes and you can't sort of sort the collation aspect out during the lifetime. Now, I've come across when I speak to clients about collation, because it's common law, it is there if we say nothing about it. Most clients would tell me, listen, it's going to lead to a fight. I do not want collation to apply. In other words, whatever I gave you during my lifetime, lucky you. But when I die, we split it this way. No fights, in other words. So if your client's instruction is that they do not agree with collation, then you would need to then draft a collation clause in your will, saying collation will not apply. Because once again, it is common law, meaning it automatically applies if our will is silent upon it. All right. So the very first two clauses in our will is actually not something your client necessarily came to see you about. It's about cancelling previous wills and about collation. Now, if your client agrees with the concept of collation, then you're not going to say anything about it because it's there. But if your client has an issue with it, we're going to have to make it as a heading and say that it will not apply. So collation is something we need to understand, and it's something we could be tested on, obviously, come exam time as well. All right. Mm -hmm. Another clause <clears throat> that we might need to consider is executorship. Now, this is an important clause, obviously. Who is going to be the executor of the will? Who is going to be the person that winds up the deceased estate? Now, ladies and gentlemen, typically you would want that to be yourselves. Because what does the executor receive? They receive three and a half percent. So 3.5 percent of the total asset value of the deceased estate. So there is money to be made in winding up a deceased estate. So that's why you'd often see some attorneys don't even charge clients for drafting wills because they're not interested in making some money on the will. They're interested in making three and a half percent of the total assets when that person passes away. So they're interested in winding up the deceased estate. So you would need an executive clause in the will. Who is the person elected to wind up the deceased estate? Now, if the client's coming to you, I would assume it's going to be you ultimately, that are going to wind up the deceased estate. So you'll have to mention, put an executor clause. I appoint Carl Kitzman, ID number so-and-so, as executor of the deceased estate. So that'll be your job one day. Ladies and gentlemen, that's extra motivation for you to also ensure that you draft this will in such a manner that there can be no fights. Because if there's arguments when that person passes away, it delays the process of winding up the deceased estate, which means it makes your job more tougher and longer to finish the process. And if it gets delayed, it means the beneficiaries just wait longer and longer for their inheritances mm -hmm. as well. All right. So construct the world in a manner that every possible argument there could be, we have an answer for how it will be dealt with already. Right. So executorship is the third clause to consider in your world. Another clause, let's call it the fourth one, is security. Now, security implies 
by law that I give proof of something. So let's say it was civil law. For argument's sake, if you lost a civil matter and you wanted to appeal the decision, what generally happens is you need to ask for leave to appeal. And what the court could do, leave to appeal for those who are unsure, just means permission to appeal the matter. So sometimes what the court does is they give you permission to appeal the matter on condition that you give security that you can pay the legal costs of your opponent should you lose. Now, the same principle applies to winding up a deceased estate. Sometimes we get stuck with complicated estates. In other words, sometimes you, as executor, when you take over, you literally act on behalf of the deceased person. And you might need to close down businesses that the deceased person had. And your duty is to close things down and wind up that estate in the most profitable manner, the manner in which the beneficiaries can obtain the maximum amount of assets from the deceased estate. Unfortunately, sometimes attorneys, they don't close down or wind up the estate in the most beneficial manner. In other words, they act negligently at times. Mm -hmm. And the problem is when you act negligently, you can cause loss to the deceased estate. So the master's office, sometimes when you apply to be an executor of an estate, they tell you you can be executor, but you need to give security. Give a bank guarantee of X amount of money that we can place on hold. So if you do act negligently and cause loss to the deceased estate, we're going to take from your money, in other words, to cover the loss. Now, that's a concept that I'm sure all of us aren't pretty happy with, but it's a real thing and can happen. So what I generally do is in my will, I create a security clause that says the executor need not furnish any security. In other words, the will is saying that I, the executor, don't need to give a bank guarantee of anything to the master's office. Now, I just want to elaborate on that. The master's office can still ask you to give security. Ultimately, they are the final say. Even if your will says the executive need not give security, they can still request it of you before they allow you to wind up the deceased estate. But because the will said the, the executor need not give security, the chances are less that the master's office will ask you to furnish security. So it is something to consider. It can make your life a bit easier in winding up the estate. But obviously, you'll need to discuss this with your client and tell them the purpose of the clause. And that they are obviously you looking to make your life easier in terms of winding the deceased estate up. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, there's another clause that I often see come by. Sorry to and, uh, yes. I am not sure if you've got your phone on vibrate or what. As the messages comes in, we hear the buzzing going on. Can we get that off the... Yes, I've got it on to silent now. I'm sure that will assist. Yes. All right. Okay. So <clears throat> the other clause, a fifth clause to consider, would be professional fees, a term called professional fees. Now, this is sort of like, a, let's call it a, a protection clause for yourself. Whatever you need to do to wind up the deceased estate, I mean, perhaps you need to bring in an actuary to calculate certain things um, or another professional person to do certain things to wind up the estate in the best interests um, of the beneficiaries. If you create a professional fees clause, you actually indicate there that you are entitled to call on any professional person to assist in the process of winding up the deceased estate, should it be necessary, and that you can then, from the deceased estate, pay these professional people. I think it's an important clause to consider because sometimes you might need to bring in an extra expert to assist in certain things, and obviously they don't come for free. So we need to be able to pay them from the deceased estate because we are using them to wind up the estate in the best interests of this deceased person. So that's another clause to consider. So if you look at these first five clauses, it doesn't have much to do for any reason why your client came to you. I mean, you speak about revocation, you speak about possibly collation, you speak about executorship, speak about security, you speak about professional fees. These are all things you need to tell your clients about because they're not coming to you to talk to you about security and professional fees. You need to bring it to them. 
Other than those five clauses, you need to explain to your client about section 2A, 2B, 2C, et cetera, et cetera. Give them their thoughts on it. Because as we understand it, it's going to automatically apply. If your client doesn't like it, we need to say something in the world about it. All right. <clears throat> now, once you've got that out the way, <clears throat> you can come to sort of the purpose why your client is there. And the purpose is to give the inheritance away to beneficiaries. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when we speak of beneficiaries from a will, we speak of two things. We speak of legacies and we speak of heirs. I'll say that again. We speak of legacies and we speak of heirs. These are two different types of beneficiaries. So, <clears throat> um, a legacy is someone who receives something specifically. So, I leave my house to X, or I leave my car to X, or I leave 100,000 Rand cash to X. I've left X something specific. Okay. X is a legacy. If I say X, Y, and Z must take the estate, they must share in the estate, that makes X, Y, and Z. Heirs. Heirs are people who don't, re, um, who don't receive something specific, but share in the deceased estate. The correct word is to share in the residue of the, of the estate. That's what's left. So I think to distinguish between the two, it's important to understand the ranking. When a person dies, the first people that need to be paid is the liabilities. All the creditors, all the people that deceased person owed money to, they must take their money first. Once we've paid all the liabilities, that's what's left must go according to ranking. Now, I mentioned earlier, the first thing we'll look at is their marriage. Is there anything due in terms of marriage? Once we've sorted the marriage out, then we look at legacies. Is there something specific that someone must receive? If so, give it to them. Once we've sorted liabilities, marriage, and legacies, out, then we have a look at what's left. What's left we call the residue. If that thing goes to our heirs. So if your client wants to give something specific to someone, you need to make a legacy clause where you nominate certain people as legatees, what they must receive. Some people don't have legatees. They just say, for example, my children must receive everything. In such a scenario, you wouldn't have a legacy clause. You would just have an heir clause. So have a look and listen to your client. Does they want to give something specific to someone? or not. Sometimes they want to give something specific to someone and they want to nominate heirs as well. So you might have a legacy and an heir clause, but ultimately you would definitely have an heir clause. Someone must take what's left or a couple of people must take what's left. You might not always have a legacy clause, but then you need to be able to distinguish between the two. And an important thing to consider is there has been issues in the past of identifying beneficiaries. So identifying legacies or identifying heirs. So when we nominate someone, make sure you put their name, surname, ID number, and their relationship to you. So let's say I want to give something to my daughter. I would say I leave my house or I nominate my daughter, name, surname, ID number as the heir or as the legatee. All right, so when we nominate someone, name, surname, ID number, and what is their relationship to you? Is it your spouse? Is it your daughter? Is it your son? Is it your grandchild? Is it your parents? You know, is it your cousin? Is it your friend? Nominate what the relationship is to you because that does assist in identifying the exact person you wanted to leave something towards. Okay. So now we've nominated our legacies and we've nominated our heirs. What other important clauses could come to tuition here? Another thing that springs to mind is guardianship. So who is going to look after your minor children if you pass away? Obviously, it's only an applicable cause if you have children and if your children are under 18. So, you know, it's usually a nice clause in joint wills. You know, obviously, if mom dies, dad looks after the child and vice versa, or if they both die simultaneously, who do they nominate? You know, you would often find uh, spouses who are um, divorced. You know, perhaps it was a bad breakup and then husband or wife or whatever the case may come to you and create a will and in their will they say i nominate my sister or my father or whatever the case may be 
to take care of my child when I pass away. But the reality is, ladies and gentlemen, who's actually going to take care of that child? It's going to be the surviving parent, always a surviving parent. The only time someone else will obtain guardianship is if that surviving parent is not fit to be the parent of the child or has no interest in being the parent of the child. So you can put a guardianship clause and you can nominate, you know, someone to care of your minor children if you pass away. But ultimately, if the surviving parents there, the duty will fall upon them unless they don't want it or are unable to do so. OK, but guardianship clause is definitely something to consider for people who have children under 18. So thinking about it, your will would tend to want change quite a bit over your lifetime, depending on how old your children are or depending on your marital status, et cetera, et cetera. You might end up changing your wills a few times during the course of your lifetime. OK. Um, another two clauses I just want to speak about. Um, funeral direction. In other words, you know, a lot of people like to say, do they want to be buried? Do they want to be cremated? Um, some people want to donate their bodily remains um, for research, for whatever the case may be. Um, just make a note that if you do want to donate your bodily remains, it is an invalid clause unless you specify to whom you're donating it to. So it must read, I donate this and this to this institution for purposes of whatever. If you don't nominate an institution who you want to donate your bodily clauses to, it is not a valid clause. We cannot enforce it. So you need to institute who you're donating it to. And then the final clause I want to discuss with you, and obviously, ladies and gentlemen, there can be more clauses, you know, depending on your client's wishes. But another clause to consider, especially if you have minor kids, children under 18, is a testamentary trust clause. I'll say that again, a testamentary trust clause. So if you nominate a beneficiary and you pass away and that beneficiary is under 18, by law they cannot receive their inheritance. You can only receive your inheritance when you're 18. So what the common law position is, is that you end up or, or your inheritance gets placed in a trust, a trust created by other people. Now, when we hear the word trust, we hear trustees and we hear beneficiaries. Three trustees, at least three people must be appointed to manage whatever's in the trust. And then obviously you'd have your beneficiary. So let's say I leave a house and two million rand to my child. Okay. I die. My child is five years of age. If I was silent on a testamentary trust clause, then the surviving family of mine would need to create a trust. They would need to appoint someone to manage that house and that two million rand of mine until my child turns 18 so they can receive the inheritance. You know? But the point is, if you're silent about it, someone else is going to do it for you. But if you create a testamentary trust clause, you can actually create the rules and the manner in which things must be done and kept for your kids until they reach a certain age. So the first things first, a trust is automatically going to terminate when that child turns 18. Perhaps you feel 18 is not a good age for that child to receive 2 million rand in a house. Perhaps I'd prefer my child receive the inheritance when they're 25. Perhaps let them go and get an education to fall back on, etc., etc. So that could be your wishes. Again, that would not happen if you didn't create your own trust because automatically we would be 18. But if you create your own trust, you can nominate. You can specify when it, when it terminates. It turn, terminates only when my child turns 25. That's when they receive the inheritance. I've seen people uh, terminated at 18, at 21, 23, 25, 30. I've even seen 35 before. So it's totally up to you. And now we need to think practical about this. On my example, a house remains a house when 2 million rand remains 2 million rand. But that 2 million rand is not going to be worth as much as it's worth now in 20 years' time when my child receives the inheritance. Plus, are we not going to be using that money to, to sort of take my, as a maintenance to get my child through school, perhaps university, um, you know, res, accommodation, cars when they're 18, sports scams, et cetera, et cetera. There can be so many expenses that my trust might need to pay. So 
how are we going to go about making sure this trust turns over enough money for my child? Because ideally, when my child turns 25, I would have liked my trust to pay for everything, plus have something left for my child when they're 25. So how are we going to get to that point? We might look at the property and say, well, listen, the property is worth a million. We can lease it out for 10K a month. 10K a month is 120,000 uh, a year. Over the course of 20 years, it's 2.4 million. Perhaps we can use the income from the house to, to take my child through um, university, to take the child through schooling, et cetera, et cetera. Right? But we need to specify that. And, I mean, you've you got to think a bit further than that. The, the house might be worth a million now, but what happens if that area becomes a bad area? Then that value of the house might drop from a million to three, four hundred thousand rand. That's what often does when areas turn into a, a sort of bad type of area. So do my trustees have the authority to then go and sell that property perhaps and purchase something else in a better area? Perhaps that's certain things I can tell or give them instructions to do. I mean, surely that property must be maintained as well. Grass needs to be cut, you know, maintenance, general maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. I need to create the rules of how they can play with that property and how they can turn money over for the property. Because I want that property to take my child through to varsity. Plus, when they're 25, they have a property they can earn 10K a month off. Right? Think of the 2 million rand you left behind. What are we going to do with that? Are we going to invest it? What type of investment? Low risk, medium risk, high risk. What can and can't we do? I also want to turn that 2 million into more money on a monthly basis with good, solid interest return rates. Ultimately, if you don't have a testament you trust, someone else is going to decide for you what to do with that 2 million rand in that house for your kid or whoever it was that you left that inheritance for. Perhaps you don't like that idea and would want to do it yourself. As such, create a testamentary trust clause and speak about how your child's inheritance must be maintained until they're 18. Obviously, if you die once your child's already turned 18, you can change your will. In the testimony trust might be irrelevant. It, it's up to you, ultimately. I mean, to give you an idea, I did a will not so long ago for a person. The will was about 14 pages, of which 11 of those 14 pages only dealt with the testamentary trust clause. So what I can advise is, if your books don't have it, because uh, I'm not lecturing from the book per se, then go to Google and Google an example of a testamentary trust. Just read it. It's for your own benefit. And look at all the different things that people consider of how the assets for their kids should be maintained and turned into more money and what rules and regulations they're giving to the trustees. Because ultimately, you might not want three people to decide what's best for your kids. You might want to leave a document that tells those three people what they can and can't do. Because where you are silent of something, those trustees must assume. So we might want to cover all our different bases. So a testamentary trust clause is another clause of a will that we should strongly consider when our clients has kids that are under 18. Because the inheritance must be kept until they're a certain age. Okay. So that's the final clause I wanted to speak to you about. Um, just to maybe add, Ladies and gentlemen, I have mentioned to you that you might want to change your will on a number of occasions. And I said to you, an easy way is just create a new will that revokes previous wills. But, you know, sometimes we don't want to change our whole will. We want to just amend a small part of our will. It doesn't mean we have to go create a whole new will that revokes the previous will. We can do what we call a codicil, C-O-D. I-C-A-L, a codicil or codicil. Everyone says it different, those that I've come across. Now, a codicil is a separate document that we can attach to our original will. And the purpose of this document is to amend a certain clause from our original will. So let me give you an example. Let's say clause five of our will, dated 1 February 2021, deals with legacies. And clause five says, we give X 100,000 rand. I made that will in one February last year. Today, I think, you know what? I'm happy with my will, but I don't think X must get 100,000 rand. I think X must only get 50,000 rand. Okay. So what do you do? You can create a new will and revoke the previous one, or you can draft a codicil. 
Now, it's a written document that says codicil on top, and all you say there is, I refer to my will dated 1 February 2021. I refer specifically to clause 5 of that will that reads, X must receive 100,000 rand. I am now amending clause 5 to read as follows. X must receive 50,000 rand. Sign it, same formalities, two witnesses in each other's presence, and attach it to your previous will. As simple as that. Now your previous will stands, except clause five is now amended to give X a different amount of money. So that is a way of amending your will, perhaps, without drafting a whole new one. It's up to your client. If your client says, I just want to amend something, do a codicil. If your client wants to create a whole bunch of different amendments to the will, it might be better to just revoke the previous will and create a new one in its entirety. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, questions? Good evening, this is Gloria. Hi, Gloria. Um, I wanted to find out with regards to repudiation, um, does it come into effect once both uh, spouses are still alive or if one is dead, that is when the other one can repudiate from whatever they agreed on in the will? Okay, so, so just to clarify, you, are you referring to master states? Because that rule only applies to massive, to nothing else. Or, yes, I am. Are you referring? Yes, to master states, it's when the first one dies, the other one can repudiate massive. So it, it, it's not done during the course of their lifetime. But I mean, I suppose you could. During the course of the lifetime, you could cancel your master state in writing because massing is the only type of let's say, method of bequeathment that allows for a termination. And just like you, if you create a will, um, you allow to revoke that will and create a new one or amend it at any stage. So if you've done a master state, you can, in writing, create a new will that says you revoke that previous will, you no longer want to do massing, and you're going to have a separate will. So it can be done during the course of your lifetime or upon the death of the first die. Oh, I see. Okay, thank you very much. Perfect. Hi, hi, this is Pacey here. Listening? Yeah, this is Pacey here. My question yes. uh, relates to um, the revocation clause. Uh, you indicated mm. one of the ways to, revo <clears throat> to revoke uh, your will is by destroying it. Now, what happens if when I destroyed the original, but there is still a copy somewhere can that person who still has a copy make use of that copy to to claim sure uh, that's often a subject of much debate hey? so usually what the the master's office wants if it's a copy it should be a certified copy of the original you know then we can use that if it's not sometimes that ends up in court about whether that will should be valid or not so it's it's not a great scenario when the original will cannot be found because the master's office wants an original will. But I have noted that uh, certified copies of wills uh, can be allowed. When it's not certified, it's up to discretion from the court then. Hi, Kyle. Hi. Hi, Hi Kyle. It's Moses. Um, oh, my God, you guys keep cutting in. Okay, go Moses. I'll go after you. I'm sorry. No, finish, ma'am, and then Moses will go straight after you. No problem. Okay. All right. All right. Um, I, I just wanted to ask with regards to um, commissioning the will, Ned. Um, I read on the notes that the will should be commissioned, but then I also heard you saying you only commission the will if it's if it's signed with the. Yeah. General. Or is it just the one with the mark? So you don't need to commission that will per se. Why they speak of the commissioning is actually in case um, originals can't be found. You know, that's a nice way of, of uh, using that will as such. You know, commissioning is necessary when you sign by someone else on your behalf or making a mark. But a will doesn't need to be commissioned for it to be regarded as valid per se. But people do commission it for purposes of issues of originals getting lost and so forth, because then they can bring it forward to show, you know, this was a commissioned will as such. So, you know, it should be regarded 
as uh, as being valid when the originals can't be found. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Yes, Kyle. It's Moses again. Okay, Moses, go for it. Uh, Carl, I'd like to know what is the impact in case uh, both witnesses uh, die? Does that what, what, what kind of an impact does it have on the will? Okay, so on the face of it, zero impact. It only can perhaps be an impact if someone disputes the validity of the will. In other words, saying that is not the testator's signature. In other words, in other words, that it's fraud. If such an argument comes forward, and we are unable to get hold of the witnesses, then handwriting experts could come into play. Does that answer you, Moses? Yes, yes. Perfect. Hi, Kyle. It's you on here. It's not. You go first, lady. Hi. All right. Uh, okay, I heard uh, a lady and then I heard you on. So let's, let's go lady first and then you on there after. Okay, uh, it's Namsa here. I wanted to know something right. about messing. Okay. Um, assuming that uh, the messing can be done by people who are marrying, married in committee of property, is that right? They can do messing. Yes. And then after the passing of one of the of the partners, then the other partner decides that uh, she or he wants to change or move away from messing. Does mm -hmm. she still have a claim uh, from the estate of the deceased one based on marriage? Okay. Mm -hmm. Or Most automatically falls to the, to the child? No, no. Keep, keep in mind that okay. marriage is ranked above wills, hey? Eh? So, oh, okay. Right. If, if, if we, yeah, so if we married a community of property and die, half of everything there is mine. So I'm entitled to my half because of the marriage. Your half I won't be entitled to because we've now cancelled, uh, I've repudiated, in other words. So marriage always comes before we consider any other legalities or common law with regards to wills and so forth. Okay, okay, let me stretch the second one. In terms of um, uh, what fide fide commissar, is there, I understand yeah. that you can only you can only uh, provide for the first and the second and the third one becomes the owner. Can you then? Is it possible to write on your will to say the third one uh, give instruction on what to do to the give instruction to the third one on what to, what, what to do to the ownership beyond you, beyond getting the, gaining the ownership. I don't know if I'm making sense. So the third person no, who are. actually gains the ownership, can you instruct or give uh, uh, on your will to say you would want the third person to give to whoever, the hmm. next generation and mention the names, or okay. you just, your part ends on the third person. Okay, so, so just to clarify, it's the second person. Remember, let's the say it's my person. house. I give my house to A, and I say when A dies, it must go to B. So B and that that's as far as I can go. Also, yeah. so I becomes the owner. B, who the owner. The house to. Okay. Yes, B becomes the owner. So I, I can't tell B what to do with that house because fedaicomism only allows two parts. If B wants to create another fedaicomism, let B do it. But I can't tell B what to do with that house then, unfortunately, or fortunately. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. Perfect. Johan, I think you were next. Thank you, Carl. Um, Carl, my question is with regards to shares. Um, if I leave shares in my will to a legacy, um, and these shares is listed on the JSE that was issued um, with the company I work for, but it's restricted shares. So meaning um, the shares are issued to me in 2022, but uh, the shares can only be realized in 2027. Now I'm dying in 2022. Um, what happened to these restricted shares? How would the executor um, deals with this restricted shares that can only be, um, be have access to in, in five years time? Uh, thank you, Carl. OK, so, so if, you, if you left your shares to X for argument's sake, shares can be transferred by law. 
it actually is regarded as a movable um, in terms of our L and D accounts. So those shares can be transferred, even the restricted ones will be put into the name of whoever your elected beneficiary was, even though it can only be realized in 2027. So they would obtain the share, but effectively only cash out in 2027. But nothing restricts them from being transferred the right uh, to those shares. Thank you, Kosi. That that means that the, the state can still be wound up, um, doesn't have to I mean, wait for that period of time where the shares are restricted in. 100% correct, because um, a transfer of a share is not a transfer of cash. It's like the transfer of a couch or a house, ultimately. So we don't have to wait for the enforcement for 2027. We can do that straight away, put the shares over to the beneficiary's name, jobs done, even if they must wait another five years to cash their inheritance out. Thank you, Paul. Hi. Listening. Hi, I just have a question regarding um, Fide Commission. Um, you stated earlier that um, a Fide Commission A cannot um, acquire ownership. Um, however, I just want to... Want... There we go. I think it was Roddy. I see the muted. Okay, sorry. Go again with your question. Sorry. Okay, so um, just with the, with regard to um the previous section that we dealt with um regarding a feeder commission feeder commission is um we stated that um they will not acquire ownership or at least the first feeder commission a um however is that there is an exception and I just wanted to confirm this um with regard to a feeder commission resident being created. I don't know if I'm mentioning or pronouncing that correctly, um, but then the Fiddy Commission A has or is entitled to alienate three quarters of the property during his lifetime. Is that correct? It can be. It, it can be. So you can, but that's a specific clause that you would need to institute. If your clause is simply Fiddicomism, then that doesn't take effect. And you only have the right to use, not to own, if you are the first receiver. But you can alienate three quarters of such. That is correct. Depending on the type of asset you, you would leave for your, uh, for your beneficiary. Thank you. Perfect. Good evening, Kyle. Hi. Listen. My name is Roddy. Uh, I just want to ask you on the codicil. You mentioned actually, basically, if there's an amendment to be made, Basically, yeah, the person actually will make the amendment as for the clause specific and get signed by two witnesses. Now, should the witnesses be the same as the original will or should it, can they be different? Will that have an impact on the will in terms of if there is an argument? So those witnesses can be different, right? It does, it does not need to be the same witnesses, Roddy. As long as it's two competent witnesses, it doesn't need to be the same. Okay, so there won't be like, for example, if this have to be an argu argued in court, like uh, that that uh, that condition is not actually signed by the testator, then of course an expert will be brought in in terms of signature and so forth. No, 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 no issues there too. As long as as long as the two witnesses are identifiable and you've signed the codicil and they've signed it, um, there would be no issue going forward. Uh, okay, thank you. And uh, sorry, I just have one more question before I leave. Uh, regarding that, the lady mentioned actually on about, let's say you are actually uh, taking uh, notes or making a will of a de death, uh, the dead bed, and uh, you being actually part of the of the heirs, so that's in indirectly um, disqualified you, unless you write a clause to say that actually the person had written the will or given instruction of the will with that and with that jurist. But then uh, there's, there's, there's not to have a witness to witness that. Okay, so, so if you put that clause in, so for argument's sake, Roddy, let me put it in perspective. I can do, let's say, my parents' will, 
and I know I'm an heir there too. So in the will, I state I'm the executor, the drafter of the will, but I'm an heir as well. So IST stater acknowledged the fact that the drafter of my will is indeed um, is indeed a beneficiary to the will, and I amend common law and allow them to still inherit from the will. That would then mean you've amended the rule, so you can proceed as such. Let's say you have not said that, but you've just um, written uh, another document somewhere where you've said, look, this person drafted my will, but I still want them to benefit. Now, that document, the only purpose of that document would be to try and prove no undue influence or no fraud. So that will help you with your argument that you should be allowed to benefit intestate, you know, even though you're the author um, of the will. So no, that doesn't need to be signed by anyone, but it should then at least be signed by the testator of the original will, because it's not a will. It's just it's just purely for purposes of trying to illustrate that there's no undue influence. Okay, thank you very much, Carl. Hello, Kyle. Oh, here. Oh. Listening. Just two questions quickly. Um, one of the colleagues before asked a question in relation to. Uh, a permission to occupy uh, in, in properties, uh, particularly those properties that are in rural communities. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not very sure of the, the answer that you gave uh, in relation to that. Surely, Carl, there should be a way in law perhaps to, to accommodate that, maybe say in customary law of succession or something like that. I mean, that situation is not uncommon among black people you would find i own a house here in town and i own a house uh, back in the rural village that i come from um shouldn't the law provide for that uh, in terms of what i want to do with that property uh, who i want to be quitted to then the second one uh, well, let's deal with that one to... first let's, let's oh, okay, deal with that fine. one first and then we deal with the second one that's okay. all right i'm just scared i forget all right, that's all right. so first things first now, we've got to divide customary law from the current South African law. Now, a lot of practices done in customary law are done different to the, the, the write-up of South African law. I mean, with marriages and so forth, I mean, you would know the job. Now, now what you often find, especially in the rural areas, is things are transferred, like uh, uh, permissions to use occupancy without actually going through the deeds office or through the master's office as such. So sometimes when you enter into uh, the occupancy thing, you can create clauses and agreements that your heirs can take over but and, and use the occupancy. But that's a bit separate from the usual current South African law. What we often find, especially with customary law, is large amounts of properties are occupied by people that do not have a title deed to the property. This is a common situation in South Africa and also a common problem that we are currently having. Because the reality is when people pass away, especially in customary law, a large amount of people do not report the deceased estates. So it's never in at the master's office. Family members take occupancy of the property and they then leave it to their family members and so forth and so forth. Until one day a particular family member wants to sell the property. And we figure out that no one is allowed to sell the property because no one owns the property. So it is sort of guided by the customary traditions. And that property never gets spoke, spoken of or endorsed in the master's office or in the um, deeds office as such. So that's the way it's dealt with in customary law. Is it legally correct? No, it's not legally correct. Is it happening? Yes, it is happening. Does it cause problems? And will it continue to cause future problems on ownership over housing? Yes. It's a big issue currently in the country. And like you correctly state, it does happen. But is it technically correct by law? The answer is no. And, and you would often find uh, if you walk into municipalities, there's large amounts of people trying to obtain ownership of property that was passed down to them. However, the person who passed it down to them was never the owner because there was some form of customary law agreement that concurred where occupancy was passed on, but there was never any registration in the deeds office. So what happens is you have people living in the property, but they can never enforce their right. So what happens if they want to sell the property to someone eventually? They sell it via contract and money, but no registration in the deeds office. 
So that works fine. But the problem is when you try and push it through the deeds office as such, it becomes an issue. Does that, that answer your question? Kyle, it, it, it does to a certain extent, but perhaps just to ask the question slightly differently for the purpose of clarity. If, 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 if you and I and, and every other colleague there um, start from a premise that says customary law, it's a recognized competent law in South Africa, which is, it, it, it's, in other words, it, it, it's recognized as, as part of the law uh, in, in the country, uh, probably uh, competent like any other law, then the question would be, what could be the correct legal position in relation to properties like that? Mm. Um, home affairs. Home affairs is a good starting point. What's actually requested of customary law engagements is that all assets and so forth gets registered at home affairs. So there's a proper passing of things if someone passes away. But unfortunately, a lot of people don't register it at home affairs. So what often happens is when it comes to a dispute over property and so forth, it ends up in high court. So the court can determine the rightful occupier or owner. And the issue that comes with that is high court is not cheap. And most people can't afford to go to court. To court. So it sort of just becomes a lull over the years with internal uh, family meetings and fights because there wasn't a proper registration in the first place at home affairs. Okay, no, that's fine. Last question quickly. Just the, the formal lodgement requirement to legitimize the will. It, it, is there anything like that? For example, if you were to legitimize a transfer of property, you know you would, you would go through a deeds uh, office and so on. Now, would, would yeah. a will that I draft at home, keep at home, maybe with one of the children at home or one of the relatives at home, be as valid as perhaps a will that is produced by an attorney or produced by a bank? Is there any, any requirement in terms of the lodgement of, of that will to legitimize it? Okay, so, so there is no requirement in terms of legitimizing of it. So what ha happens is when you pass away, wills are then produced, right? There might be one will, there might be multiple different wills, unfortunately. Yes. So what happens in such a scenario is those wills are then conferred through to the master's office. So before you as executor take over the estate, the master needs to see the will and make a, a decision on what will be incorporated and who's going to be the executor. So they will then look at the wills and say, right, you have three different wills, for example. Um, let's look at the last dated will. And does that will have a revocation clause? If so, the others fall away. If it doesn't have a revocation clause, then that's where the interpretation comes in. Let's try to read all the wills and try to make sense of it. And then, you know, obviously it goes without saying your last dated will tends to be given more preference, you know. So there's no requirement in legitimizing it as long as it's in writing, signed by witnesses, and it's dated, that is produced, and then the master will ultimately make the final decision over what will will be incorporated. Thank you. Perfect. Hello, Carlo. Here. Yes, listening. Yes, just to, 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 to add on this question from the gentleman um, about the permission to occupy in, in, in rural areas. I hmm. also had um, an issue whereby somebody passed away and they have bought basically the permission was given to somebody else and they've bought the property from the person who, who occupied, who was given occupation. The only person that can actually address this issue is the tribal authority themselves. We had to refer the matter to the tribal authority. Nowadays, it's very better because they keep records and they had to find the person who actually sold the property to the deceased and they transferred the property to the beneficiaries of the disease and find the person who passed it on without the permission of the tribal authority. So it must be addressed by the tribal authorities. Correct. That, that is what happens because they keep records of all these things. But unfortunately, what happens is like you just said over there, they had to find the individual. And sometimes they can't find the individual and it becomes a bit of a headache. 
And then sometimes you see these matters being tried to push through the court for answers. And it becomes even a more bigger headache because the court's rules are more sort of stricter compared to the customary law rules. So that issue, yes, keeping records of occupancy with the tribal authority definitely comes into play. But what you often find is the tribal authority is unable to locate certain individuals as well. And that's where the big problems come in. So the point is some form of recording must be kept of things that you're doing. Whether you've recorded your assets at home affairs, which is the way South African law recommends, so they can keep track of things, or whether you've recorded it at the tribal authority. As long as it's recorded, there's no issue in passing on. But so many properties are not recorded, and we cannot find the individuals who pass things on. And that's where the big headaches start coming in. Hi, Kyle. My name is Hi. Garat. Um, I just have a question with regards to attestation um, and just um, jumping onto the question that the previous gentleman asked with regards to lodgement. So our notes mention that um, it is not a requirement for the will to be dated um, and attestation is not is not a requirement as well. And you just mentioned now that the will must be signed um, for it to be legitimate. Um, so I just want to know where do we stand? Does the will need to be signed or should it not be signed? And does the attestation clause, um, is it applicable? So the, the will needs to be signed, right? That, that goes without saying, but it could be electronically signed as well. Um, the problem is when you don't have signed wills, um, there is, we can just mute. Um, there's a bit of, uh, I'm not too sure it is. Okay, there we go, sorted. So the problem is the courts have a big issue with wills that are not signed, right? Um, because they are unable to track it to exactly if it is that person's indeed will. Because anyone can draft a will for anyone. If it's not signed by that person, it's not your will. So as far as formality goes, signing is very important. Dating a will is not a formality by law. In other words, your execution clause as such. However, if you do not date a will, again, arguments will follow. If you note it from the formalities, we didn't indicate dating is a formality for a valid will, but I said we should date our wills. And the reason for dating wills is that if we don't date it, then all the wills will be read together and arguments will follow which was the last will, what was the last wishes. So if you have one will that gets produced and that will's not dated, that's not a problem. But the question is when more than one will gets produced, the issues start coming in. So dating is not a formality, but it's not the most clever thing on earth to not date your will, as it could cause problems after death in terms of interpreting what wills should be used and what not. All right, thank you. Perfect. Kyle, uh, it's Jonathan. I've, I've got a, a scenario. Um, when you speak of preference, uh, you, sp you spoke about marriage uh, uh, taking preference or uh, I just want to know if person X and Y are married in community of property, person Y inherits a, a family home. And upon the dissolvement of the marriage, the decree states that that family home, uh, person X and Y does not live in that family home. So when they get divorced, the decree states that that family home will then belong to person Y. But person Y de then does the, uh, within the three months does the will, but neglects or for whatever reason does not transfer the property onto her name. And then before the, before she decides to transfer it, she passes on, and in her will, she states that that property must now go to her heirs, right? Okay. okay, so 
the, the divorce decree would take preference because that's already a court order that specified what should happen. Um, and then with regards to the property, interesting with property, property can be transferred even after you die as long as you had a personal right there too. So let us say why signed an offer to purchase, a contract to purchase that property as such, and it's in writing. Why then has a personal right? So upon Y's death, the executor can act on Y's behalf to transfer the property into Y's name, and from there on, that property can then be transferred to Y's appointed heirs. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Um, I'm listening. The executor will need to set up one with the family members. So the family of them, and ultimately the issue is that the executor can't then design a trust with their own rules that the executor deems just. These trustees would then have power of assumption to act in the best interest of the trust without specific rules set out for them. Thank you. Perfect. Um, hi, hi. Uh, this is Jonas. I just want clarity uh, with regards to uh, the maintenance. And okay, I did, just to clarify, uh, sorry, Jonas, we'll listen to you. And then after you, it's Fatima. Okay, go, Jonas. Okay, all I need to understand to, 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 to get clarity on it, uh, uh, how do we maintain the identity of the witness? Um, I just want to check as to whether is there any requirement. Uh, assuming, for example, you just mentioned that uh, it sometimes it happened that uh, somebody, a patient calls you uh, at the hospital to say to assist him or her with, uh, with a wheel. Then uh, it happens that uh, on your way there, um, maybe you, 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 you do your documents there, but uh, here is somebody whom you think uh, can be a witness to you, and this is the person that you do not know. All I need to know okay. is, can you use that particular person who, uh, as per age, if you estimate it's uh, above 25 years, can you use that person as a witness to that particular will that you need to assist your, 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 your client as a patient by that time? Yes, yes, you, you can do that. What you do, let that person sign as witness. But on the will, underneath where they sign, let them record their full names, their ID number, and their address. All right. So if that person ever needs to be called as a witness for whatever person, they can be traced and located. So it's always a good idea to leave some form of contact details of the witnesses behind. Because if they are needed, we can locate them. Name, surname, ID number is good enough. But generally, I like to put an address there, and I like to put a cell phone number there. Then we could obtain a random individual to witness our will, no problem. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Fatima, I believe you were next. My question was answered, thank you. 100%, uh, I see um, who else is there. Katrejo uh, here? Yes, listening. Yes, I just wanted to ask in regards to uh, the living will, right? Um, yes, I see that it's it's basically conditions that if ever um, you are at a point you would want to die, then would it include euthanasia? No, no. So, so a living will is separate from euthanasia. Euthanasia is illegal in our country. So you can't decide when to take someone of life support. In our country, only uh, the doctor or the surgeon confirmed with two other doctors or surgeons can make the decision of whether someone should be taken off life support. So living will is more um, just to give the doctors permission to give you whatever pain medication is necessary to ensure you are out of pain, even if it accelerates your time of death, on the basis that you have no reasonable prospects of survival. But the moment you have reasonable prospects of survival, a living will wouldn't even come into play. 
Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, the last question. Uh, when it comes to initializing the pages of the will, do witnesses have to uh, initial every page or is it just the test data and test and so forth? So, so the test data needs to initial every page and sign the last page. The witnesses only need to sign the last page for it to be valid. Okay, okay thank you, sir. You know, and, and just to put it in perspective, I mean, when I do wills or when I draft contracts, I have my witnesses initial every page as well. But the fact that I let them initial every page doesn't make the will more or less valid. The only requirement is that they sign the last page, the two witnesses. Okay, thank you, sir. Perfect. Um, we'll Mr. do two Clark. more questions. I'm listening. You can proceed. Hi, Kyle. Join us once more. Uh, I just want to check uh, again. You mentioned that uh, euthanasia can be uh, on the life will. Uh, euthanasia is something that is not allowed. Assuming it happened that uh, the person is on life support and uh, somebody just discovered that will at a later stage while the person is on the life support, what what exactly is supposed to happen there? So, so it only comes into being when someone has presented it to the hospital as such. So if it, if it wasn't presented, no one can take liability for it and no one can suffer a consequence there too. But the moment a living will is brought forward and made to the, put to the attention of the surgeon or doctor that is in your care um, or that is taking care of you, then it comes into effect. So ultimately, if you have a living will, you would want to give it to someone trustworthy who you know would present it where you are unable to present it. Okay, assuming it is an accident that took place in Johannesburg and uh, this person was staying in Limpopo, then uh, the surgeon who's got that particular will is in Limpopo and it is discovered late that that person is already admitted and is under uh, uh, life support. Uh, I just want clarity right there as to whether can it be executed or not. It, it can be executed, but only from the time it comes to the attention of the surgeon that's taking care of you. You know, so it can still be executed. Um, yes. Then that uh, it's not going to be uh, considered as a euthanasia. I mean, no, the action no, of that it's not euthanasia. Yeah, yeah. Keep in mind that a living will doesn't give um, a euthanasia uh, permission. It doesn't allow for euthanasia. You know, it just allows for scenarios that could accelerate your death when you have no reasonable prospect of survival. Now, ultimately, life support is cut on the basis that there's no prospect of your survival. You know, so it's if you read into it and you look at the T's and C's, it's got more to do with keeping you out of pain than anything to do with euthanasia as such. Yeah, maybe follow up, Kyle. Uh, it happened that uh, these are two guys whom, uh, who, ha who actually happened to be in ex on accident. And uh, mm -hmm. the two families are there. The other one has a will. The other one doesn't have a will. But the two families were actually making a call to say, uh, we think you should take away the life support. And fortunately, one of the family members come forward and say, yes, we've got uh, 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 here is a, a will for uh, patient X. And patient X and Y, both patients, their families were saying, take away the life support. But patient X, by virtue of having uh, that particular will, then the life support is taken away. And for that other one, it's not taken away. The other, can't that other one of the two family can't claim to say the other family was assisted. Though the will was there, uh, it was euthanasia that was actually apl applied on that uh, on the patient X, but it was refused on patient Y. Okay. Well, to put it in perspective, that would only be allowed if that doctor felt that, um, let's say it was patient Y who brought the living will, um, that would only be affected if the doctor felt that patient Y couldn't survive because a living will cannot give permission to euthanasia. It shouldn't be. If that was done, I disagree with what was done. I don't believe that's totally legal. Um, 
but the doctor would incorporate the living will if they believe prospects of success, prospects of survival are limited because no one can say, not even your living will can tell a doctor to take you off life support if the doctor believes that you can survive whatever predicament you're into. So, yeah, I, I hear you, um, but I, I would like to know from the doctor whether that was uh, prospects of survival. Because if the answer is yes, then I don't believe a living will can give you permission because um, euthanasia remains illegal in this country. No, no, okay. Uh, no, I'm okay, Kyle. I hear you. No, I, I hear you. It's, it's a difficult one. Um, but, you know, with things like that, it's very difficult, and this applies to all aspects of law. It's sometimes difficult to pose a situation and say, but this situation was handled differently because every situation is unique and it has its own certain elements that no one or that we don't know about until we go and get all the information there too. So I've got a feeling there's certain elements or certain things uh, that the doctor can bring forward to say this, this and this is why it was done ultimately. Because as far as I understand it, you can't just take someone with life support if they can survive. You know, so there might be other factors here too that, that we're not well aware of. Then, Kyle, tell me what if maybe uh, the situation is uh, this are uh, the children of, uh, uh, um, they are my children. Both of them were traveling together and they happened to be on the same accident. But one of, the, of my child didn't have a, a living will, but the other had a living will. And the one who was, who had a living will wasn't that bad, wasn't that bad, but uh, uh, the doctor could see that uh, the chances of survival was not there. And uh, the doctor, again, has to make a decision, but based on the will that has been submitted late to say, uh, you know, uh, this person, uh, my, my, my child A, uh, had a will, and he said he doesn't need this and this and this to happen. Uh, to actually try to bring his life back. Uh, therefore, and they all are on the same life support. Therefore, uh, because of this will, we request that you execute this will, uh, take away this life support. And this is the one that was better than the other, who doesn't have a will. Then in that mm. case, uh, will, or will, 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 will it be correct for the doctor to take out only the life support for one of its two children and the other one was worse. the other one was at least a little bit better but the the prospect of, of 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 coming back to life was not there but the doctor could see that it uh, for sure this other one uh, is a uh, it's, it's a patient that uh, unfortunately we don't have power we're supposed to take uh, to take this person out of life support and as because of the will then they take away they, they remove that uh, the, 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 the life support for that other person with a will. Um, how do you how do you think will it be correct? I mean, for 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 the doctor to only consider that without considering the other one, which is the call from the same parents. Look, uh, on that principle alone, yes, because the one had a living will, the other didn't. You know, if there's no living will. Look, it's just not a moral argument. It's a legal argument, you know. So uh, if there's no living will, ultimately, the law is in place where the doctor can only take someone off life support from um, confirmation from two other surgeons as well that agree with him or her. So actions regarding people with living wills compared to actions regarding people without living wills does differ uh, at the end of the day. And, you know, if you ask me if... if if that's right for the doctor to act one way with the living will and not the same with the other one, indeed the doctor could be guided by the living will to such a sense. And if there is no living will, the doctor must also be careful to stay within the South African law because if they do something that doesn't correspond to the current common law that applies, they can be held negligent ultimately. So yes, that those two kids would have or could have been treated differently from one another. Okay, but despite the fact that uh, the call is from the same parent. Despite the fact, because yeah, the, the call uh, how is, old are these kids? Despite the fact that uh, the call it's uh, the, the call or the request is from the same parent 
who uh, by perception, the other one who uh, doesn't have a will is the one that uh, it's that's likely not to, to, to survive. Yeah, no, despite that fact, because uh, a doctor cannot um, act on person's recommendations. They can only act on law or the basis of living rules. So, yeah, uh, unfortunately, there would be different treatments of people, even if the same parent requests something different. Okay, no, I'm all right, Kyle. Uh, Mr. Kyle? Right, yes. Uh, can I check here with you? Uh, the, uh, if I can give you a scenario, uh, the husband passed on in, in 1999, December 26, and got, was buried uh, bef uh, on the 31st of, 2000, uh, of 1999 because they were worried about year 2000. They didn't know what was going to happen. So he passed on. They didn't register the, his death uh, with home affairs. Now the wife passed on this year, 2021, uh, last year, 2021, and the status on the, mari the marital status appears as she was still married. So now, um, how do I go about reporting that uh, estate with the master where you find that the husband, uh, that death was not reported and there's no death certificate? You see, that's, that's one of those challenges I was mentioning earlier about not reporting things can become a headache at a later stage. You know, that, that makes it very difficult. I mean, ultimately, you would need to prove that your husband died. You know, um, if that's not reported, you're telling me that there's no death certificate for the husband. No, yes. The, it was, yeah, with home affairs is not registered, but we went to the Catholic Church who keeps the record on their side. They do show that he was buried on this uh, uh, um, uh, by the funeral yes. palace, but they don't have the B16 something, uh, which has uh, the, 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 the details of when he died and stuff like that, except that they have uh, entered his death with their own manual uh, system at the church. But there's nothing okay. else as far as uh, um, the home affairs is concerned. And the children can't remember who were the undertakers at the time. Sure, and there's no closing of bank accounts back then that can be followed up on or notification of debtors or things like that. Uh, not that I know of that the wife has passed on, so they don't know. They don't know who to ask because the wife uh, stayed with this marital status as married from 1999 until her passed on, on in 2021. Oh. 21. So no one knows the kids are alone. Oh. And I, 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 I've been trying to assist. Home affairs are, are not coming forward. And I really don't know how to report this estate. Mm -hmm. You see, look, uh, look, I'll be honest with you. This is an estate that I wouldn't like to be an executor of. And it's not a, a scenario that I've personally encountered. I mean, how you would go about doing that, because there's so many complications. First things first, now you've got to prove this individual died in 99. So whatever information you have, you'll have to give the master's office, like you said, they're the Catholic Church. But then when that person died, that person in 99, half of their estate was only this woman's estate. The other yeah. half was his estate to give out. So now the question is, did she take his whole estate for the next, let's call it 20-odd years? Because yeah. now if she wants to distribute her estate, must we first not split the estate between her and her husband um, and give half in terms of interstate law uh, to the husband and half in terms of interstate law or a will, depending if she had one, to her beneficiaries? But then the other question is, if he died in 99, then the next 20 years, whatever she's accumulated, was not for a husband to share it, you know. So mm. it becomes quite a quite a mess to sort that out. What I would advise is you arrange a personal meeting with the master's office. So find out what master has been elected to act over this deceased estate, give them a reference number as, as such, and arrange mm. a meeting with the master and sit down with the master because ultimately whatever you do needs to be approved by the appointed master. So sit with them 
explain the scenario, give, bring that proof from the Catholic Church, whatever you had, and speak to the master about the best way to deal with it. Because personally, whatever I tell you, I'll just be talking with you. I've never dealt with a situation like that before. But all I can tell you is every time I've had issues, I've arranged meetings with the master and sorted it in, in that manner. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, Sorry, just, it's not much of an answer, but yeah. Can I just ask one final question, please, before the first decision? All right. Ladies and gentlemen, just to clarify, please just make sure we are muted. I see you in the, in the, boys in the background. This will be the final question for the evening. Yes. Um, if I did not get to you, if I did not get to you, please record your question and ask me it tomorrow night. All right, let's continue with the final question. Okay, so I just wanted to ask in a uh, uh, particular thing. Uh, uh, um, I just wanted to ask in relation to presumption of death. How will my will be executed in that scenario? Sorry, there's this background music that I'm hearing. I'm under yeah, the two young players. Uh, someone is playing music in the background. If we could just make sure we mute it. Um, yeah, there we go. You can just, there's the music again. So yeah, if we can just try again with the question now, because I couldn't quite catch you. Okay, so I just wanted to ask in relation to uh, presumption of death, right? How will my will be executed? How, how do you mean in, um, in, in the case of presumption of death? Oh, okay. So, in other words, you can't be fined or declared, or well, there's yes. no death certificate as such. Yes. All right. The, okay, then presumption of death is something that gets done at the police station as such, and, okay. and person gets presumed dead. So, you'll need uh, documentation and confirmation from the relevant police station, whoever's dealing with this matter, to get a presumption of death. And then you'll have to use that presumption of death documentation that you obtain at the police station as your death certificate at the uh, master's office. But they, I know there is time periods that need to pass by, et cetera, et cetera. So you'll just yeah. need to speak with the police station as such, but they can give you that document. Okay, then, so the war will be executed the normal way, as long as I have the- Yes. The, okay. No problem, thank you, That's sir. That's it. Perfect. Kyle, I have a last uh, question, please. Ladies and gentlemen, okay, I heard two people. This will be the last two questions. If you have any questions, please record it. Tomorrow is another night. Ask your questions then. Okay, let's go for it. Can I please go first? Sure. Uh, right. Okay, um, Kyle, let's say um, I, I registered an RDP house using someone's child birth certificate and simultaneously nominate him as, uh, as my beneficiary when I died. Then down the line, I found girlfriend and we have children and so forth. Then later on, I died intestate. What will happen that RDP house since well, it is, it is registered with someone's child certificate? Yeah, you see, that's also something that you often find arguments over the high court. Now, what I've noticed with the high court rulings is they always favor registration. So okay. if there is registration over someone, that person will take preference. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Um, right. Carol, just a quick Last one. question. Um, nothing to do with the course, but is it at all possible to actually start the session at maybe six o'clock? Because some of us just get home around quarter to six. Um, look, that, that's something you'll have to speak to the law school about, or uh, Zakiswa, or whoever the case may be that you're dealing with um because yeah, i'm not the one who creates the platform i'm just the one that says i'll be there when the session starts so i know as it starts it's for 5 30. if i get notification to start at six i'll start at six but until such time i'll have to just questions i mean there might be two or three you have. I'll listen to your questions and I'll take them. Tomorrow is another night and we'll continue there. Hope tonight uh, benefited us to a certain extent. And then uh, enjoy the rest of your evening and I'll see you all tomorrow night.
Thank you. Okay, Kyle, bye. bye. Thank you. Oh, bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to. 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 I'm going to